Hello everyone, welcome to Jeff's Best Bets. I'm your host, Jeffrey Allen Turner, aka Mega Jetty One, and you can bet on that. Today, I'd like to introduce you to the show with an interesting subject. This subject happens to be one of my second favorite uh, space themed, uh, space themed, wow, first episode and I'm already screwing things up. <laughs> Good thing I'm off script. Anyways, yeah, like I was saying, first episode happens to be about Star Trek. Star Trek happens to be my second favorite space themed franchise. Why second favorite? Well, in case it's not obvious. Star Wars happens to be my first favorite. But I can easily go on and on about Star Wars anytime, but I don't want to do that today. I want to take some time, you know, lean right into it. So with that said, I'd like to tell you how I got into Star Trek. Star Trek, well, interesting story. It started when I was a little kid, you see. The um, first movie I ever saw, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. The one with the whales, as everyone knows it infamously for. <laughs> but I will say this. The, um, the movie, I love it. Everyone keeps saying Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is the best in the franchise. I politely disagree. You see, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan started it. But Star Trek IV The Voyage Home is really where it should have been. What do I mean by this? It's an interesting thing. Everyone who often talks about Star Trek, they like to say Wrath of Khan is the best because, well, I think it's because of the dynamic between Kirk and Khan and the sad, tragic ending at the end of the movie and all that. But the truth is, that's not what Star Trek's all about. Star Trek was conceived to be a space adventure, and yes, there would be some form of conflict, but it wouldn't be about an adversarial conflict. I mean, occasionally they did have it, but that's not what it was meant to be about. You see, other than the Klingons or the Romulans, there never really was much in the way of a standalone villain. There was a reason for that, because it was meant to be practically a utopia of a future. Now, Wrath of Khan comes along. It's a great movie. I will not deny that it is. But the thing is, Wrath of Khan was meant to be, was meant to be like Moby Dick. You know, Kirk is meant to be, you know, Captain Ahab, and Khan is the great white whale, and vice versa. Khan is the, is Moby Dick, or, or, I mean, Khan is essentially, uh, A Ahab trying to hunt Kirk, thinking he's Moby Dick. It goes either way, but the point is, the, um, the fact of the matter is, that's not what Star Trek is really meant to be about. Star Trek was not meant to be based on, you know, Moby Dick at all. It was a good idea but for one movie, but that's not essentially what the franchise is known for. It's about uh, exploring different worlds, m learning about other cultures and all that. And Star Trek IV really is essentially what that is supposed to be. Because you got this alien probe that comes out of nowhere, and it's wondering where all the humpback whales went. And in Star Trek, the humpback whales have been extinct since the 21st century. That would be roughly around this time. So, Kirk and crew, they gotta do something out of the blue. They gotta time travel back to Earth's 20th century, the 1980s. My favorite decade, by the way. And bring humpback whales from the past into the future to tell this probe to go do whatever. The point is, though... When they go back to 1980s Earth, they find that it's not exactly the way they envisioned it, or re even remember it. Because the crew of the USS Enterprise, they only know about that time period by records. But it's one thing to read this historical decade, 
and another thing to actually live in it. So, yeah, it's pretty much a big culture shock. They don't get profanity. They don't get all the, um, what is it, uh, exact change. They don't get all the lingo. It's funny. That's what really made it a good movie because that's essentially what Star Trek was supposed to be about. Adventure, explore, exploration, and yes, occasionally questioning moral and ethical dilemmas. It wasn't always about having to fight and destroy. That was always a Star Wars thing. Star Trek was not known for that. Now, I think they did. it was good every now and then when you did have an adversary. Because that's the interesting thing also, is the Federation and the Klingon Empire dynamic. It was essentially mirroring real world events. The Federation was like the US of A, as our beloved, well, I won't go much into that. Um, and I know, I sound stupid right now. But after all, I'm winging this because I had a whole script planned, but it didn't go quite the way I was hoping. Kept messing up. But yeah, basically the U.S. of A. was essentially the Federation. The Klingon Empire, Soviet Union, Russia. A.K.A. Um, I don't think there was much in the A.K.A. aspect there. But yeah, essentially the dynamic between the two was mirroring the Cold War, which was the time they were living in. And you know how I know that? Because my stepdad lived through that a lot more than I did. Anyways, when Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, came out, they even made that more apparent. The destruction of the Klingon moon Praxis, that was essentially mirroring the Chernobyl incident. Excuse me? And the fact is, they also even had the Klingons, when they were invited to dinner on board the USS Enterprise, they kind of uh, behaved like the Russians did. For example, they said the one General Chang, after making a um, what was it? Not Macbeth. Um, uh, a Shakespeare reference, Hamlet. Yeah, Shakespeare Hamlet reference. He says, "You've never uh, no, not General Chang. It was Chancellor Gorkin. My mistake." He says, you never experienced Shakespeare until you've read him in the original Klingon. <laughs> and that's the thing. Shakespeare was never invented on, a Kling on the Klingon homeworld. That was an Earth thing. And the Russians were kind of like that. They kind of, they kind of said something along the lines of, you never experienced this until you've read it in, or seen it in the original Russian. So, yeah, it was, it, was, it was poking fun of it, but at the same time, it was mirroring it. But yeah, the thing is, they were reflecting the times they were living in, and that was interesting. But at the end of the day, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, is essentially what Star Trek was meant to be like. Now, over time, they, kept still, they still kept doing the whole action drama stuff, and it can get good. You know, it helps develop the characters. I mean, you need a little conflict. That's the one thing that the original creator, um, Gene Roddenberry, just didn't get. I mean, initially, they, there may have been conflict, but over time, he kind of let his ego get to him. He wanted to, you know, he wanted to keep it all peaceful, but, and no, absolutely no conflict whatsoever. If he had it his way, Wrath of Khan would never have been made, or even been the way, as good as it was. Thankfully, some people were willing to oppose him on that. Wrath of Khan was good. Star Trek 60 Undiscovered Country, that was good. But Star Trek 4, I think, is essentially the embodiment of what Gene Roddenberry wanted the whole franchise to be. Heck, the first few seasons of Next Generation, that's essentially uh, Gene Roddenberry's baby. And essentially, there was conflict. All right. There was conflict between Ron Berry and the people that were trying to keep the series going. That's the thing. Sometimes when creators, they create something, but then they lose control of it. You see, they have this idea. They want to put it out there. But then people love it so much 
They want to expand on it when the creator wants to keep it exactly where it was. And sometimes keeping it where it is is not a good thing. Sometimes you need to expand, then go back to the roots, then expand again. That's what all that's all a part of growing up. But the creators oftentimes they real don't realize they're losing control of their franchise. They forget that just because they create it doesn't mean they fully own it. See, when the fans love it enough, they will want to do things. And because of that, the creators lose control. It's kind of like wrestling. You know, Vince McMahon may have created Hulkamania, but the fans took control of it. You see, Hulkamania grew beyond what Vince McMahon intended. Now, essentially because of that, Star Trek, it started off as Gene Roddenberry's baby, but then it grew beyond what he expected it to be, and he didn't like it. So, yeah, there was the, uh, the issue there. So, Star Trek is now becoming more action-oriented and less philosophical, unfortunately. And this was not this isn't just in recent years. This was in the years as even great Star Trek material was being made. The movies, the newer shows, they grew to be less like what Gene Ron Barry intended and more into what studios wanted. Action. Mindless action. And occasionally mindless action is good, but when a franchise is built on something, it's okay to have a little mindless action. But to have it take up the chunk of the entire franchise, uh-uh. I don't like that. The thing is, Star Trek was always meant to be philosophical. Look at Star Trek IV. There was a lot of philosophy in that. And that's what made it the best-selling uh, movie. I mean, nowadays, you look at all the Star Trek movies that have come out in theaters. None of them have been able to live up to how much, how great the theatrical release of Star Trek 4 was. Star Trek 4 made I don't I don't I honestly don't know. I didn't take the time to look it up, but it made a lot of money, a lot of money. And because of that, I don't think any movie has ever lived up to that hype since. I don't think even the 2009 reboot uh lived up to lived up to that hype. I mean, yeah, there were a lot of great a lot of great things about it. But essentially that movie was so packed with mindless action and less philosophy, it was practically a Star Wars movie. In fact, I think J.J. Abrams, the, crea the maker of the movie, essentially came out and said that. Essentially, you had um, this threat come along, it destroys a planet, and it's going to go and destroy another one, and the heroes have to, st have to destroy the weapon before it destroys the, the second planet essentially like what the original Star Wars movie was about. <laughs> Knock on wood. But anyways, the movie franchise, the TV fr series, all of it, it's not what it used to be. It's mindless action over philosophy and moral and ethical dilemmas and debating about those dilemmas. And because of that, it feels like the franchise has been hurt. There's this thing called identity politics, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but the truth is I don't think I really want to because I've never been one for politics. I've preferred entertainment over politics. But the problem with studios in Hollywood these days, they want to push their politics into en the entertainment to the point where there is no more entertainment and it's just all politics. I say that is dumb and stupid. The entertainment franchise was not built on politics. It was built on entertainment. And they're killing the entertainment. How can you expect to make money if you kill the very thing you're supposed to be marketing, which is entertainment? And because of that, there's these new nut job wackos called social justice warriors that are often dubbed NPCs, non-playable characters like in video games, and 
I honestly, those all these terms are just new to me because they're internet terms. I just call them idiots. I just call them whack jobs, nut jobs, wackos, all those. Why? Because that's what they are. Because they're insane. They're killing the very business they're trying to profit on. Who does that? Who does that? I'm trying to make money so that I can make a living. You don't see me pushing my politics into this video. If I was, well, it probably wouldn't be as good as it might become. I want this video to take off. I want to make money. But if I go pushing my politics into it, I'm likely to lose viewers and money. And when that happens, when that happens with these studios, they double down on their stupidity and they insult the fans and the customers. And that's stupid. You're, it's like you're trying to lose money. It's like you're trying to go bankrupt. You don't do that. That's stupid and completely backwards. It's like these aren't even real people. They are essentially, like the internet meme is, NPCs, non-playable characters, computers, bots, p beings of no intelligence that just say the same stupid stuff over and over again, thinking it's the truth when it clearly is not. I mean, clearly, the, the studios and Hollywood, they have no intelligence whatsoever. They have no common sense. If they did, they wouldn't be doing this garbage. I get it. You have your politics. That's fine. But keep it out of the workplace. You don't infect all your all the stuff you're working on with your stupid with your stupid politics. And even if it's not stupid politics, even if it's intelligent smart in politics, you'll leave it out. You don't put it in, so to speak. I know. I know. I know. Bad joke. But anyways, the point is, Star Trek is not what it used to be, first because of conflict over wanting to change it from philosophical stuff to mindless action, and it's even worse now because politics, personal, present day, real world politics are being shoved into it, and it doesn't need it. There's no place for it. This is set in a fictional future, uh, an idealistic future. And these people, these idiots, they want to put in stuff that deconstructs this franchise. The franchise doesn't need deconstruction. It was perfect up until, I don't know, 10 years ago. It was perfect. It had its ups and downs, but it was perfect. Perfection, now I know people say there's no such thing as perfection, but I'm a bit of a yin and yang kind of guy. I believe there's good and evil in everything. I believe that there is such thing as flaws as well as perfection and that one leads to the other. You start off flawed and your goal is perf and perfection is the goal. You'll never truly achieve it. But for one who acknowledges that they are flawed and yet are striving for perfection, that is perfect balance. There is no such thing as completely flawed and there's no such thing as complete perfection there is a f going from one to the other and finding middle ground in in all that i believe that there's no no com perfect good there's no perfect evil there's everything's in between maybe i'm now maybe there are the few exceptions people who choose to be outright despicable just because they can. And I believe there are people who are genuinely good, who do their best to be good all the time, even if, you know, people don't get it. Bottom line, <sighs> bottom line is, I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars more, but the thing is, I love this stuff, and what I love is being tarnished. Studios, get your crap together. 
this is the part where I gotta get a little scripted here. Now, um, let's see here. Um, uh, th 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 um, give me some. Give me a moment, please. Um, ah, uh, yeah. After Star Trek Into Darkness and Star Trek Beyond, both involved J.J. Abrams, were released. Uh, people believed that the franchise was no longer what it was known for. Deep, moral, and ethical, mindless... Uh, oh, my mistake. M m I misread. Deep, moral, and ethical issues over mindless action. They then made a series called Star Trek Discovery, a show that looks like the J.J. Abrams movies and completely ignores the history of Star Trek, the Star Trek series is known for due to low budget. Uh, uh, I complete. This is why I don't like reading from a script. I end up uh, jumping par sentences and lines and all that. Okay. Uh, it had Klingons, a race of, that looked a certain way in the original series due to low budget. But it was changed for the movies due to higher budget. Then the series has... Uh... uh, uh, uh uh, again, I completely lost it myself. Maybe I should have made bigger lines between each... each. Uh, okay. Then this series has Spock. Basically, they changed up the Klingons. Uh, in the original series, they had flat heads like us humans, but they had these eyebrows that made them stand out. But, now, but then in the movies, they gave them these... these rigid foreheads. Um, but now in the the new series Star Trek Discovery, they changed them to com be to be completely different for what they've been known for over the last twenty years. Then the series has Spock have an African American human adopted sister that had never been established before. Also, none of these things ever mentioned Cybok, Spock's half brother from Star Trek V: The Final Frontier, and yes. I know it wasn't the best, but at least he contributed a lot better than a woman named Michael, who Spock and Sarek have never once mentioned. Star Trek Discovery, or STD as it is shortened to, is a series made by people who dislike our current elected official who resides in the White House. They don't know the first thing about Star Trek. Otherwise, they would be more respectful of the lore and the history of the franchise. They don't care, and because of this, they think they, that because they own the property, they can do whatever the hell they want with it. Well, they can't. When no other Star Trek films or shows were being made, we, the fans, we kept this franchise alive and breathing when the studios were running out of ideas for good stories to tell. Now, fans of the franchise who, who can think better stories than Hollywood and these studios, uh, they respect the history and the series and are trying to create fan films based on it to help expand on it, just like they've always done. Cr novels like the, uh, the, the Con Trilogy, they were what made the kept the franchise going. Now they also make fan films um, due to YouTube and all that. Fan films that likely don't make a dime and are probably done for recre recreation and fun. Yet they're being told by these damn studios to cease and desist because they own the, the control the rights to Star Trek. Last time I checked... This is the United States of freaking America. A country founded on the Declaration of Independence. A country whose First Amendment allows freedom of choice, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and most importantly, freedom of creativity. If people want to make a fan film based on something they love, that's freedom of creativity. When a studio issues a cease and desist order on a fan film, any fan film, they are violating the First Amendment and should be arrested or at least sued for it. <sighs> the studio may own the rights to Star Trek by contract, 
But Star Trek survived for years because of its fans who strove to keep it going by writing novels and comics as well as making video games. I understand that these people who, whose books, comics, and games were published were under contract. But in the end, it was fan interest that made them money. Unfortunately, we live in a time where crazy nut jobs are running good franchises like Star Trek into the ground because they want to shove their damn politics into movies and shows that have no place for it. Star Trek at one point reflected the real world with the Federation. Yes, I said all that before. But here's the thing. Studios want to shove dumb stuff like their identity politics into great franchises, claiming they are fixing them when they were never broken to begin with. Star Trek was a series about equality that is being destroyed by people who talk about equality but don't actually believe in it. In conclusion, in regards to Star Trek movies and probably Star Trek as a whole, my favorite will always be Star Trek for the Voyage Home. Yes, I know everyone claims Wrath of Khan is the best, but I'm not everyone. I have my own individual thought. Star Trek IV is the best example of what the franchise was meant to be like, not like Star Trek II, which is trying to mimic Moby Dick. Sure, that's cool and all, but that's not what the franchise is meant to be about. <clears throat> Star Trek IV is, is where the franchise needed to go after all the depressing stuff in Star Trek II and Star Trek III. With everyone dying, they needed a lighthearted tone that involved saving defenseless humpback whales from extinction. It didn't need a lot of action because there was no need for a villain. And there was no need for a villain because the character interactions and growth made up for it. Also, people rag on the music composer, but I rather like his score because it harkened back to the original series. And... The moment the crew were introduced to their new ship at the end of the movie, <laughs> that gave me chills and I wanted to cry. As I grew up, you know, I got used to it, so there was no need to. But now, in retrospect, I kind of want to cry every time I see it. <sighs> With that said, I will always love Star Trek for what it was and what it can be again. But what I will not accept is what these wackos controlling it are currently shoving into it now. Until they get their act together and realize that they're hurting themselves by hurting the franchise and us fans, I'm not going to buy a single thing from them and hit them where it hurts most, their wallets. At this time, identity politics is stupidity and it's spreading like a virus. Franchises like Star Trek, Star Wars, Marvel, and, and many others, they're falling victim to this. And what's worse is that the franchises controlling th these, is that the studios and all that that are controlling these franchises are ignorant to it. These people pushing identity politics into them are being rejected by us fans slash customers. And when they insult us with words that have no meaning to us, the companies side with the nut jobs and start to lose money for it. Not realizing that they are siding with nut jobs will leave them broke and bankrupt and all these great franchises will end up in the public domain. Personally, on one hand, I like that because, you know, stories like Sherlock Holmes all and, um, what else? Uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, the Alan Quartermain stuff, Jekyll and Hyde, the Invisible Man, all of those are in are public domain. And I would love to see Star Trek and Star Wars and Marvel, all that, become to public domain. But that would mean not getting many movies based on them for a good while. But at least us fans would have control over them. Unfortunately, these corporate hacks who are controlling them and siding with the nut jobs they hire, they're killing the franchises. <sighs> okay. To cut this out, I'd like to paraphrase Whoopi Goldberg from the basketball movie known as Eddie that came out in the 90s. Do you hear that? 
That is the sound of the fans. You may have bought this franchise, but you didn't buy them. They're fans because they have a sign on them that you don't understand. It reads, not for sale. Bottom line, no fans, no fun. No fun, no business. We didn't bail on them when times were bad, and we sure as hell ain't going to bail on them now. The times are worse, because we are not letting you take away this franchise from us. You're going to have to haul my ass off this court, because I'm not moving. And you can bet on that.